the Lord puts this in the today. Um, I'll just give a couple of minutes, everyone. Uh, it's 7.57, so uh, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, I would like to first thank you for coming to the webinar tonight. It's a, a very important webinar. One of the important aspects of this webinar is that we're trying to say to save or not to save the turf. Maybe that is the question. And that part will be given by Dr. Ehsan Alati, a specialist periodontist at Precision, Ortho, uh, Precision Periodontics in Chatswood. And the first part will be given by Dr. Gary Basharma. It's on the aspects of invasive survival resorptions. Now, it's a very important part of the whole trip of planning. Uh, when you have a patient presence in your practice and you have to give a imperial endo lesion and you're trying to think which way it's coming from, is it the you know, endo origin, is it a primary endo and secondary endo, or primary peri and, 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 and secondary endo. The issue is how to diagnose. And in many ways, uh, you probably come across to those aggressive invasive cervical receptive lesions that appears near the gum line. And uh, we know that when they pin the gum line, they may be very complex, not just that simple. So that involves the periodontium, so it becomes a type of endoperial lesion anyway. But mainly the two speakers here today are experts in the field. And I'm delighted to present them today. And both uh, Dr. Dr. Garima Sharma and Dr. Esther Malati are specialists in the fields so of endodontics and periodontics. Specialty. Uh, Dr. Esther Malat is also an implant surgeon, and uh, they all come with wealth of experience. So without much ado, I want to thank you for being here with us. And I think I'd like to give the stage to Dr. Gariba Sharma to start a lecture. Before you lecture, Dr. Dr. Sharma, just a question. If you have questions, would you mind writing on the chat box? And I'll be able to sort of present those questions to the speakers. Uh, once they, uh, they'll speak each one for about half an hour, so I'll be able to ask those questions in that time. I have some questions of my own, which I'd like to ask if your questions and my questions coincide, fabulous. But, you know, all questions will be taken on board, and that is to help you assess, you know, your patients the right way. Now, so once again, welcome from uh, International College of Dental Practitioners. We teach... We teach you how to diagnose, how to treat and plan, how to think and assess your everyday cases in the most simplified way. It's a multidisciplinary faculty. We are all together to help you. And so you're welcome. So without much ado, Dr. Sharma, stage is yours. Would you please proceed? Thank you. Sure. Thank you everybody for um, coming this evening after a busy day of practice. Um, thank you, Dr. Sarkis, for inviting me to present today. It's actually a very interesting topic, and I think it's a topic which all of us as clinicians face on a day-to-day -day basis when we are seeing patients and we want a treatment plan. We always wonder whether we can save it or we need to extract it. There are, you know, multiple factors we need to take into consideration when we are, you know, treatment planning cases. Factors, patient factors, you know, but few factors like invasive cervical resorption or endoperio cases, when they come into the picture, it makes the treatment planning a little bit more complex. Um, so I'll start off by talking about invasive cervical resorption. So invasive cervical resorption is an external root resorption. It's very insidious. That means it's very slow growing. It, it, you know, it would be there for a very long, long time before we can actually know it's there. Clinically, it can be a normal appearing tooth as in the photos uh, in this slide. So if you look at the tooth, you wouldn't even know that there is a resorption going on unless you start taking radiographs and investigate further. But sometimes later in the stage, it can develop to have a pinkish discoloration or it may have an irregularity in the gingival margin as in photo on the left-hand side, my left-hand side. Um, and when you take a radiograph, it, the resorption has gone quite further into the tooth. 
most of the time, these resorption cases are usually painless because there is a protective thin layer of pre-dentine and dentine until late in the process when you know there is a bacterial invasion into the pulp space, then only it will get symptomatic. So when we look at such cases, we need to know how much the extent of the resorption is because that is what um, helps us in planning for you know the treatment if it's only into the dentine or it's invaded into the radicular uh, pulp space or it's gone into the um, you know further down the route so Jeff had to say who's like the resorption guru I'm very fortunate to be trained under him in Adelaide um, so he did this clinical classification um, for invasive cervical resorption so if you look on the picture on the right hand side, it's a class one lesion when there is resorption only in the only in the little part of the dentine. It's not even gone into the pulp space yet. So that is class one cervical resorption. Class two would be when it's gone a little extension further into the um, coronal pulp chamber. Class three, of course, it's gone deeper into the dentine and it's involved the coronal third of the root. Class four is when the resorption has extended beyond the coronal third, it's gone pretty much into the middle third or maybe the apical third of the root. So keep that classification in mind because that helps us in treatment planning. It helps us to know the extent of the resorption. And of course that would help us in determining whether we should save it or extract it. So when we talk about resorption, we always wonder what causes cervical resorption? Um, there's usually a damage to protective cementum and cementoid layer on the root surface. So that damage can happen either by trauma or by any physical or chemical trauma, or there might be developmental defects into the tooth. So whenever there is uh, any kind of trauma to the tooth and there is damage to the protective cementum layer, what happens is there is possibility of the growth of clastic cells or the resorbing cells that come from periodontal ligament that start all that process. So Jeff had to say, um, he looked at a lot of factors that uh, predispose a tooth to invasive cervical resorption. Trauma, of course, is one of the most important cause or trauma is one of the factors, especially the luxation injury when the tooth not only has trauma, but has also had suffered a luxation injury. Orthodontic treatment. Bleaching, however, it's a very small chance, only incidence of 1.96%, so essentially less than 2%. If there is damage to the cementum by deep periodontal scaling or planing, when there's damage to cementum, or especially when it's an unerupted tooth and we need to do a surgical exposure, that time if the protective layer is damaged, there can be an incidence of ICR. Sometimes in a tooth, there can be a developmental defect. There might not be that normal CEJ. So those kind of teeth are also uh, very much predisposed or they have a greater chance of developing ICR. So when we look at all the factors, sometimes invasive cervical resorption can be multifactorial. They can be combination of factors. The patient may have had trauma, may have had orthodontic treatment, then may have had bleaching as well. So there's combination of all those things happening over a period of time. But if we look at only the sole factors, if we have to say there is only just one factor that would have caused it, then it's usually the orthodontic treatment that even comes before the traumatic injury. Um, so if we talk about solo factors, then yes, orthodontic treatment first and then traumatic dental injury. So what can we do about ICR? Can I ask a question? Uh, sure, sure. So with orthodontic treatment, uh, <clears throat> um, have you seen anything in the literature um, talking about what type of orthodontic movements or what type of orthodontic appliances are 
more likely to cause this or um, yeah yeah so most of the papers they don't talk about or the literature does not show what kind of technique even in mm -hmm. this um, you know had say paper they said it doesn't depend the kind of technique or how long the treatment it's been there mm -hmm. but if there are more traction forces or more active forces on a tooth mm -hmm. you know uh, and depending upon you know what they have done to the tooth or if that tooth previously had a surgical procedure suppose it was an unerupted tooth and there was a surgical procedure required and then they had to move it very further down then of course there are more chances of that to developing resorption however mm -hmm. there is no difference in the technique or you know mm -hmm. the type of treatment per se mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah okay thank you so if we talk about icr definitely we need to know how further the resorption has extended into the tooth before we can plan whether it's worthwhile saving or not. Um, but the basic aim of treatment uh, of resorption is that we need to be able to remove all of the resorptive tissue from within the tooth. And sometimes the, if you look at histological studies, this kind of resorption is very fibrovascular. So there are lots of channels that are intercommunicating within with the periodontal ligament that makes it harder to treat and that's why there is more recurrence of invasive cervical resorption because even if there is a single strand of vascular tissue left behind or a tag left behind it can reoccur so we should be able to remove all of the resorptive tissue from within the tooth and which gives us a base for placing of a restoration or to restore that defect later. So that can be done either mechanically or chemically. So we need to remove the defect and inactivate as well. Heather say actually recommended the use of trichloroacetic acid, which actually causes coagulation necrosis of the resorption. Um, and it also inactivate, it infiltrates into the tissue and infiltrate all those fibrovascular channels. Um, and TCA is also very good that it makes the defect avascular. So it helps clinically that there'll be less bleeding because these type of resorptive defect, the main problem with that is that they bleed a lot when you get into the tooth. Um, it hampers the vision. Um, so yeah, once you remove all of the resorptive defect, we need to restore and do endodontic treatment as necessary. But of course, in class four cases, um, then there are so much of infiltrative channels, um, they, you know, they are very hard to treat. So class four cases are definitely not restorable or not treatable. So with the, um, <clears throat> with the cases that, um, the resorptive lesion is subgingival mm -hmm. uh, or like uh, equigingival. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's some subgingival, I, I assume that uh, generally a flap needs to be raised. Mm -hmm. But if it's equigingival, um, is it safe on the uh, on the gingiva and the, the, the surrounding periodontal ligament, for example, that if we uh, use TCA in a, uh, without raising a flap? Yeah, but you need to be very careful because it can actually burn the tissues. Mm -hmm. So whenever you use TCA, you need to be very careful that it's, you know, just gently dapped if you're mm -hmm. using a micro brush so that there is not even an extra drop that can fall by the time you take from your nurse and put it in the patient's mouth. And also mm -hmm. you need to isolate the tissues really well. So it doesn't even go on the gingiva. Otherwise it can cause, you know, necrosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, careful use of TCA is highly recommended. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about endoperio cases before um, we discuss some more cases. Um, so of course, endoperio, it's been, you know, discussed from long, long time, even from 1960s. The periodontium and the pulp, they have embryonic anatomic and functional relationship. So if we go back into our histology days, um, so ectomies and chymal cells, they proliferate to form the dental papilla and the follicle. 
which are the precursors of the pulp and the periodontium. So if, if during root development, any of the strands of the ectomies and chymal cells get trapped, this is how lateral and accessory canals are formed. And the, all these canals, they are the pathway for communication between periodontium and the root canal space. So all our lateral canals, accessory canals, apical foramen, they can be more than one most of the time. They can be developmental grooves. They can be invaginations in the tooth um, or even grooves as well into the root. Sometimes the perforations. Um, if they have, a, if they've gone into the periodontium and there is a periodontal defect, then even though we seal it well, there will always be that defect there. So if we look at just the root canal ramification from end point of view, um, there are at least 17% in the apical third, which is of course less in the middle third and the coronal third, but of course all these are, are pathways for communication between the pulp space and the periodontium. And even we have accessory canals in the furcation area of multi-rooted teeth, which can be as high as from 25% to 28%. Okay, so let's discuss some cases uh, about invasive cervical resorption. So this patient, um, 40 years old male, he was referred for anodontic management of tooth 1-1. So if you look at the clinical photo in the middle, you can, you know, you can't see any resorptive defect, um, even though he's got gingivitis, inflamed gingival margins, but there was nothing that could be probed clinically. Of course, once you take the radiograph and you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the moth-eaten radiolucency in the cervical third. And there was history of trauma when he was 12 years of age, so a long time back. Um, however, he did sustain another trauma a few years back. So with diagnosis and treatment planning for resorption, it's very important um, that we do take a limited field of view CBCT scans because 2D radiography have good limitations. Um, sometimes you cannot fully see the extent of the resorption and even the circumferential spread. Um, so the CBCT scan, of course, you can see on the left-hand side, there is a break on the palatal side. Um, it does extend from the coronal. By the time you remove the resorptive defect, you're almost in the middle third of the root. So yes, one option is extract and have an implant. Um, however, the, even though it's a borderline case, patient was very keen to save the tooth. He understands um, the long-term risk. And you know, if he sustains another trauma, um, there's a chance of fracture of the tooth, definitely, um, or even recurrence of the resorption. So the plan was to do the endodontic treatment and the repair of the resorption. Um, so in the second clinical image, you can see actually the resorption extends uh, quite deep into the middle third. And sometimes when you are removing that resorptive defect, you can see those hard calcified tissue uh, because over a period of time, what happens is these fibrovascular tissues can sometimes even become fibro-osseous, so they can have calcified tissue within the defect itself. Um, and of course, the root canal system gets calcified over the years as well, after all this trauma. So the resorptive defect was removed. Um, and the uh, root canal system was filled with GP and sealer below the level of resorption. Uh, MTA was placed at the level of the resorption so that it's sealed well, you know, at palatally as well. So it's, it, it's done from within the canal, not raising the flap. 
Um, and then GIC was placed on top of the MTA and then back to the referring dentist for the access restoration. This is a, another very, very interesting case um, shared by my colleague, Dr. Mary Rahimi. So this girl had trauma when she was seven years of age. She presented when she was 13 years. So at the time in 2013, this is how she presented. She had um, labial sinus tract and of abscess around that tooth. Endodontic treatment was initiated and, um, you know, it was medicated and finally obturated when this, the sinus tract healed. And in, in the middle radiograph, this is how it looked three months uh, from the initial presentation. At the six months recall, it looked pretty promising that, um, you know, there was some evidence of initial healing of uh, periapical pathosis around 1-1. Following on from that, 18 months recall, uh, that was pretty good as well. Um, it looks there is some infill of bone. Uh, and then for some reason, um, she couldn't come up for the recalls until in August 2020, which was just last year. And in the meantime, she had orthodontic treatment. She had bleaching done because she was, uh, she really wanted to lighten the color of the tooth. Um, and then she noticed some discoloration around her, you know, the gingival margin. So this is back in August, 2020. And because as you can see clinically, there's a defect around the gingival margin. So this is the um, CBCT in August, 2020. So yes, she developed invasive cervical resorption, um, which was also very well treated by my colleague, Dr. Rahimi. So he, he raised the flap because it bent subgingival um, and then he restored it uh, as well. So this is how it looked. So this, this case, um, she had trauma, she had orthodontic treatment, she had intracoronal bleaching. Um, however, you must appreciate that the lesion, all of it has healed pretty well, um, apart from the resorption she developed. Um, so the resorption also looks pretty, pretty well, you know, well done now, the defect. Um, so is it the initial trauma that led to this resorption? Or is it the trauma from the orthodontic treatment? Or is it the bleaching later on? Or I'll, pro I'll say it's combination of all of these factors. Trauma, then orthodontic treatment, you know, of course, she had bleaching in between as well. Um, and she had um, high freedom attachment as well, which I'm sure Esan can uh, point a little bit more into the details of that, and especially with high freedom and orthodontic treatment. So that is also a kind of, you know, um, trauma to the tooth uh, with such renal attachment. So yes, she had all possible predisposing factors for resorption to occur. Okay, so now the case that actually led to this webinar was uh, this endoperio case and which had resorption. So this patient I initially saw uh, who was referred for endodontic treatment of tooth 41, a 50 year old female. Um, she complained that she's getting recurrent abscess from uh, 41. Medical history, pretty unremarkable. Um, so this is the radiograph. You can see, um, you know, radial essency in the cervical third of the root. Um, on clinical presentation, she had gingival recession. She had labial sinus tract. 
on the CBCT screen, you know, scan, you can see there's complete loss of labial cortex. So advanced perio condition. She did have a history of orthodontic treatment. Nothing against orthodontic treatment though. <laughs> um, she had very deep periodontal pocket of 10 millimeters, uh, of course. For one, didn't respond to any of the pulp sensibility test. So when I saw this um, patient, you know, uh, we discussed all the options. She was very keen to save the tooth. She did not want it to extract and have an implant. However, that treatment option was also presented to the patient. Um, then I spoke to Esman and we discussed this case that if the periodontal prognosis, if he thinks it's deemed suitable, then uh, combined endodontic and periodontal management could help us in retaining this tooth. Which of course, um, Esan agreed to and the patient was pretty happy to proceed with the treatment as well. She understands that it is a, you know, a compromised tooth. It's got, you know, guarded long-term prognosis, but she was very keen to save. Um, so the treatment was initiated, um, two canals located in that for one. Um, though most of the time I like to treat the resorptive defect from inside the tooth, if we can have an internal approach. However, because it was a 4-1 and the plan was to raise a flap anyway for periodontal management, it was much easier to deal with the resorptive defect um, when Esan raises a flap for periodontal debridement. Um, because internally, if I had to go and drill out all of the resorptive defect, it would weaken the tooth quite a lot. So after the endodontic treatment was completed, um, I put a deep seal over my root fillings to make sure there's no communication between the root canal system and, you know, um, the periodontium or, or, you know, whenever Asan does his debridement. So this is actually after the completion of the treatment. Um, so this is when Esan raised the flap and he could see the uh, resorptive defect that was restored by GIC at the time. Esan, do you want to talk about the case now or do you would like to talk later? Um, I guess I'll, I've got my own slides, so I'll probably just uh, discuss it at, um, yeah. when I go through my own slides here. Yeah, yeah. okay, sure. Um, so the 12 months review is pretty promising for that patient. So this is pre-op on the left-hand side. Um, and at 12 months review, there is, you know, um, she's got that labial board support as well. The soft tissues look pretty good. Um, the sinus tract had healed after the first anodontic treatment, first visit of anodontic treatment. Um, she's not having any discomfort. Her soft tissues look good. Uh, radiographically, it looks are good as well. However, it needs to be monitored. All these cases or any of the cases, um, they need to be monitored long term to make sure um, that things are progressing in the right direction, even though 12 months review looks pretty um, promising. Um, I would also like to discuss another case, which is actually um, Pretty good um, from a discussion point of view. So this is a 63-year-old female who presented complaining of recurrent episodes of pain and swelling, which is associated with tooth um, to six. She is on six monthly prolia injection from the last six years. Um, looking at the radiograph, of course, we can see a radiolucency surrounding that mesial root. There's no evidence of root filling. So the first thought would be, okay, the, there's infected root canal system um, because the mesial root has not been cleaned at all. Um, and we think, okay, maybe if we address that issue, we can solve the problem. But if we look at, you know, 
it's it's not just the endodontic treatment or just one part of the puzzle that's missing. Sometimes it's it is a big puzzle. You need to put everything together. So looking at the periodontal tissue surrounding that tooth, it's got a very deep pocket, as you can see in the picture on the bottom. And if you look just at the radiograph, it's you know it still looks that it's doable. If I go in and medicate and you know clean that root canal system well, probably we'll be okay. But so I I discussed with Esan and said, okay, if we need to see how if he's happy with the periodontal prognosis of uh, the tooth. But when he took the um, CBCD scan, of course, you can see there is great tufocation involvement um, and there is through and through defect. Mm -hmm. It's just not the um, missing part or inadequate root canal treatment, but it's got advanced periodontal um, problems. <laughs> so, however, we can't just say each and every tooth. So this tooth, unfortunately, was deemed periodontally very poor. Um, uh, I add something here that um, one of the um, factors that also um, was sort of against uh, trying to save the tooth was uh, anatomy of the tooth, which had relatively short root trunks. So basically, and I, I believe that's one of the reasons that this tooth actually ended up with a, a, a perio involve, involvement uh, to begin with and, and then eventually communicated with the endodontic infection. So uh, if you have a look at the cross section of the CBCT and, and compare the, um, the, the six and the seven, so that the two six and the two seven, at the same uh, cross sectional level, we can see that uh, the, the tooth number two seven, the roots are still fused together or basically the uh, that we haven't really entered the focation area yet, yet. whereas in the 2.6, uh, the focation is already started. So the tooth had a sh relatively short root trunk, which um, moves the uh, entrance of the focation quite close to the gingival margin. And, and that's a very limited uh, distance for the bacteria um, to, to travel, to, to, to become subgingival and, and, and create a, a pocket. And, and from a uh, uh, periodontal uh, point of view, also debriding uh, such a defect when we have a, uh, you know, uh, basically a, a, a through and through vocation is, is, is almost impossible. So uh, even though that the endodontic uh, prognosis might have been, you know, relatively fair or satisfactory, uh, given the fact that uh, we have two canals that have not been treated properly, uh, but the perio prognosis. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Just from a from from a prosthodontist point of view, I think all the effort that would have been carried out in this tooth, unfortunately, at the end of the day, uh, when you remove the crown, this tooth would be unrestorable because there's a minimum amount of survival mm -hmm. remaining to restore. That's right. Mm -hmm. Short roots. Uh, so I think um, I think it's advantages for the patient in this case, you know, not only biologically but also financially to remove this tooth and as, some, uh, as you have pointed out, you want to maintain the existing scaffolding to be able mm -hmm. to graft. And you did immediate grafting, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right. So here we can see that the sinus is uh, relatively close and, and we already lost a fair bit of the, the, the palatal bone, uh, the buccal, um, um, I think that's, uh, yeah. So the, the palatal bone is, is uh, advancedly damaged. The, the buccal bone is sort of moderately damaged. Um, so uh, most likely if, if this tooth is going to be re restored or replaced with an implant, uh, it's going to be a, a, a sinus uh, lift scenario. But uh, in order to simplify the, 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 the future implant placement and, and be able to get away, um, uh, you know, with doing a crestal sinus lift, then a, a potential lateral window sinus lift, then uh, generally in these situations, I prefer to take the tooth out and, and simultaneously do a, a rich preservation 
uh, situation uh, just try to preserve as much as uh, of the of the height and and the width as possible and then later on um, that in in most cases it enables us to uh, to proceed with a um, with an implant placement um, um, and a transcranial uh, approach rather than the more invasive uh, lateral approach. Yeah, I mean, I, my preference is always this transcranial approach, mm -hmm. which is just minimal trauma, minimal, minimal possibility of recovery. Uh, you know, there's a two schools of thoughts. One says remove it and allow the tissue to heal, and you go back in and do grafting. I mean, I agree more with your uh, case of immediate grafting. What would be your thought pattern, why would you do immediate grafting rather than waiting for tissues to heal and then you go grafting? Can you comment on that, please? Sure. Well, in <clears throat> in this case, given the degree of damage and, and the, the loss of the bone, the height and, uh, you know, the, the width that we have, if uh, if we take the tooth out and, and, and do nothing at the time of extraction, everything's going to collapse and we uh, definitely going to end up with needing a, a, a lateral window, even uh, e even, you know, maybe a lateral window is going to be a, a tricky one with the very minimal um, uh, you know, remaining bone height. So it's, it's actually going to end up being a staged <coughs> lateral window rather than a simultaneous uh, placement uh, lateral window. So it's going it to take even longer and longer become more cramp. complex. Yeah. Longer clinical cramp from the implant point of view. And, uh, it's, <coughs> you know, restoring a vertical height is, is almost an impossibility. People That's right. Married, they are, everyone has one case to show, but the rest of the case are never there. That's right. right. Well, great. Uh, sorry, Karima, please, please continue. <laughs> that was actually my last slide, so thank you. <laughs> you can continue, Asan, with yours now. <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. Well, There's any, any other question that... Uh... Yeah. Any questions okay. for Karima? Anyone? Can, can you write here, please? I'm happy to pass that on. No one? No questions? I have a question for you, my dear. Sure. Um, you know that child at 13 years of age with the author... Yeah. Finally, with the orthodontics, did you end up uh, saving that tip or did you remove it? I think it's on slide. I'm just trying to think. Could you both have a slide for me? What show is it? Slide. Um, yeah, yeah, we saved the tooth. So it's actually my colleague, Dr. Rahimi's case. He was very kind enough to share that case. Um, so, yeah, he actually saved, saved the tooth. You know, I know that Dr. Ahim is very motivated with the dentist, right? He wants to save the tooth. It's his belief system. I think that's wonderful. We've been colleagues for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So he saved the tooth and uh, back from 2013 until, you know, August 2020, he actually, and he just saw the patient um, yesterday to treat that resorptive defect. So that patient had, you know, trauma initially, then um, orthodontic treatment, and then she had Resolve, uh, you know, bleaching as well. So, okay. The other question is concerning the same patient. There's a consensus of thought pattern. One says, basically, uh, uh, you should remove the root filling and put some dressing there, and do your orthodontic treatment, and then you complete, uh, then you complete the root therapy. And the other school of thought says, no, nah, finish your root therapy, start moving teeth. What is your thought on this? So they've been actually. Uh many papers, a lot of lit review on both the thought process and there are two schools of thought as you mentioned, but preference is to, um, you know, clean the root canal space well and fill as, as best as possible um, and then wait for a little while before you start moving teeth. How long would you wait? It depends upon the type of injury. So if it's a vulgar injury, you know, it's, it's different. If it's a vulgar injury, I would rather wait six to 12 months before we start moving teeth. If it's just a luxation injury or if it's just, you know, pulpitis that happened in between the orthodontic treatment, uh, I wouldn't wait a year. I would wait three to six months. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on what kind of injury happened at the time. Let's say, let's say you're noticing type three, uh, cervical resorption pattern occurring. Which, uh, this is type two or three from your end. I mean, would you say this is type this two? Is, yeah, I would say two. Two, okay. Let's say along the prognosis, you're seeing type three, it's starting to happen. Uh, and uh, the other resorption lesions occur. I mean, I'm talking about 
you know, replacement and uh, you know, resorptive type of lesions. Uh, where would you where would you decide we're going to hang on to this tooth? And and I mean, if it's a resorptive, I understand. If it's a resorptive, but it's a, if it's a resorptive, an ankylosis, if it's a re replacement lesion, then that's fine. But once you have an ankylosis, where would you decide in a growing child there's an ankylosis you need to inform the parent of the future ramification, especially with the children with a very high smile line, those of a you know, long, uh, long facial types, you know, uh, dolico type faces. Do you ever have those situations where there's a sort of step in the smile line, there's a like hypo occlusion? Have you had that situation at all? In yeah, yeah. So such kind of cases, especially in a mixed dentition or a growing child, these kind of cases, they pose, you know, great difficulties in planning and actually the treatment itself. But if it's and closest with replacement resorption in a growing child, I would consider decoronation. Mm -hmm. um, so that would actually help in the ridge preservation height mm -hmm. and even the width. Um, and, you know, that would help in the alveolar ridge growth as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Well, that's, that's a fantastic case. And obviously, you have a frank discussion with the patient's parents and the patient that you can do only your best <clears throat> and the biology will decide the rest. Yes. Dr. Sarkis, I think uh, there's a lot of participants asking questions as well on the chat. Uh, if you could address their questions, there's Fiza, Mughal, Nimesh Patel, uh, Catherine Yang, and Hedy Malak ask uh, specific questions. Okay. Uh, if you can go through one by one. Okay, Fiza Mughal, uh, is that a, a, a thank you for presentation. In case of a subject of restrictions are placed after repair of cervical defects, have you seen any gingival recession in post-treatment cases? Yeah, definitely. It can happen if there is subgingival restorations and, you know, there can definitely be, a, you know, a defect associated with it because, of course, the epithelial attachment um, after you placed a restoration and when the ginger was shrinks. So, yes, it can happen. It would be, a you know... Um, especially in an aesthetic zone or in anteriors, this is where it can be challenging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we need to consider when we plan such cases. Right, okay. Uh, the next question is uh, addressed, um, is again um, addressed uh, to myself and to you, Garima. It's by from Dr. Nimesh Patel. And it says, what would be an ideal post and the restoration for this type of external resorption case? What would you say before I answer my question? <laughs> in, in, in the current slide? Yes. I feel the restoration which is there at, at you know, the present time, provided there is no further trauma and there is no further, you know, uh, progression of the resorption, which is it's currently adequate. I wouldn't, um, being an endodontist, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think it's any other restoration that would be needed because it's essentially an palatal access cavity. There is yeah. no other restoration, and now there is a mesial restoration on where the um, resorption is. So I. I would yeah, I would avoid cost at all costs. I mean, that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Uh, because your adequate uh, uh, tooth anatomy and adequate yeah. core strength, especially cervically, mm -hmm. to maintain this tooth. I've been putting a post here. There's more chances of, in the case, there's other resorptive areas about the start. You create more communication between the, you know, canal and the periodontal ligaments. Also, you weaken the tooth. Yes. Uh, I would say normally teeth of this size are large pile chambers. They're already weak, the start weak. Mm -hmm. My my advice would be to avoid post as much as possible. I mean, I would try to reduce the occlusion of this tooth and continue to monitor the patient and make sure that there's no no uh, any exclusive contact on this tooth and it's splinted, so it's not going to move. Just maintain. I would avoid post normally at all costs. I'll try to avoid post when I can. Okay. And so, Sarkis, uh, so uh, I wasn't talking about the post in this particular case. Uh, I was just asking about when there's an external resorption at the cervical margin and we're trying to actually have a coronal restoration on that. 
mm-hmm. whether you would you prefer any adhesive restoration where there is of course there is a subgingival involvement so isolation is a key mm-hmm. uh whether would you actually consider something like an mta or some sort of uh, amalgam restoration how would you get the margin because of course uh, in a younger patient aesthetic is an issue so mm-hmm. whether when we do the full coverage or something like that how would you place your margin what 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 would be the situation there when there is a cervical sub subgingival involvement in the external resorption the answer depends on where the subgingival lesion is and perhaps uh, uh, got... the picture that i sent you yeah first go we can answer the prognosis piece based on the position of the cervical lesion i can answer the other part mm-hmm. in terms of mta or amalgam especially if it's an aesthetic zone um mta can discolor teeth very well so i would be very wary about putting mta and also it's it's not uh, you know subcrestal otherwise it will wash out putting mta at this place mm-hmm. um so i think as long as we can um control be bleeding you the person someone there's a noise there i'm sorry to this to carry on give me mute okay go ahead please okay so as as long as we can maintain you know a good isolation and hemostasis at that point and there's no bleeding there should any issue with the margins or you know placing of the restoration in that point what would you say sarkis this is a tough question uh, i think what nimesh is saying is you have a high smile line with high skeletal margins triangular teeth and thin biotype let's look at the worst case scenario okay you got a thick biotype it's up there i mean uh, as some you might come in here i mean you might be able to try to says so, but i would consider biological i mean i'll rather put gic there if i have to and seal the problem i mean i wouldn't try to go labially uh, i mean th- there's a way i would do it if it's close to the margin is uh, i mean composite bonding is quite possible but you need, you need to get dryness now mm. again if you can go labially and very gently try to clean the cells keep it dry with some sort of a in a very maybe diluted I'm not I have never done this by the way I'm assuming you can dry the cells again bond to the system fine but GRC would be more ideal because we can dry this to get a more biological bonding in that area so I would go GRC that would go very fine through the burrs I go subgingivally and gently polish those area that's what I would do I would do as minimal as possible uh, the more you try to put around those teeth the more it's more likely to lose its core strength that's my opinion yeah yeah i completely agree with you yes definitely gic works well in yes sir what's your opinion here can't hear you asan yes sir you there yes yes um I, I agree and i think it's it's best to keep it simple in these cases uh um, Uh, the the way i see it if it, if it's going to end up uh, being too complex and and also um uh, it involves a lot of work then we have to really from the beginning from the outset we have to really consider extraction as as probably a more uh, more valid uh, valid solution so th- these cases i i suppose um one way of uh, one one factor in favor of uh, retaining such a tooth is is if 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 accessing the 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 resorptive lesion and and putting a restoration um can be done relatively conservatively without uh, r- compromising the rest, uh, you know restorative prognosis of the tooth uh, that much okay there's a question from Catherine Yang to run will the prognosis be different between class 5 cervical sub restoration and a crown with a crown making procedure so we're assuming uh, it's a different age Okay. I'm assuming that for this patient may not be, but let's assume that this patient is now 35 years of age and the tip is stay there. That's my understanding. And uh, uh, we got the different prognosis. So I think it's it, it's very hard to, uh, I think if this patient lasts about 35 years, his age is doing very well. Would you believe that or not? Would you agree or not? Yeah. I'm only assuming. 
Uh, and um, normally, with um, so when you try to go crown lengthening of the incisors, you can't just do one, you're going to do the other ones, okay? If they have a gum asymmetry and a high smile line, with all the high smile lines, you have to get symmetrical, you know, proposition right across the board. Yeah, the you know, symmetry has to be across the midline. The more close your midline now, the more you have to really respect symmetry. As you move away from the midline, this is Shishi 995, you have to, you can get away with less, you know, symmetry or more asymmetry. So in this case, you're removing a crestal bone and that's a really important bone for the incisor. So if I'm gonna remove more crestal bone, I'm gonna say, hang on a minute, be losing more, more chance of doing implant here later on or uh, doing other options of treatment. I think uh, is gonna talk about different options of treatment. Uh, uh, can I go to the next question? What, uh, this is from Hadi Malak. What is your endodontic protocol to promote continued root formation in an immature non-vital tooth, Dr. Sharma? So immature tooth, non-vital. Yeah. Um, you know, we we can um, we can do um, just just a second. Yeah, I will um, get on to that in a minute. So we can do continued root development by, um, you know, trying that um, epexogenesis. Mm -hmm. um, by, uh, you know, putting MTA and promoting bleeding from the apical part of the tooth. Um, mm -hmm. However, it it's it depends upon whether there is why the tooth got immature, whether it's uh, you know, trauma to the tooth or it because of the developmental defect. These kind of cases work very well if there is, you know, suppose there is a dense vaginatus and it got immature because of the fracture of, um, um, you know, um, the pulp horn on top of the tooth. So, yes. I think, I think what, what, the, what the doctor's trying to say, Hadi's trying to say is that if you're immature too, would you consider long-term hydrogen you know, uh, well, saying, uh, calcium hydroxide uh, dressing there for a long time, like, oh, you know. Like, it, no, I, I, I don't favor long-term, you know, dressing. If, if the root length has formed fairly enough and still it's an open apex, then I would rather do a, a MTA apex. That's right. MTA and a lot of Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, yeah, no, I don't do long-term. Um, However, it can be done. Some some people still do it, but uh, there's no harm in that. But mm. um, these days, nobody wants to, you know, come back so many times. And sometimes you lose this patient while waiting for six months in between the visits. Yeah. Or, um, so yes. So as soon as you just said, I'm telling you, lose the patient, and we talk later over this time. It's it's all about the maintenance protocol. So before we start the treatment for these complex cases. You're going to discuss the maintenance protocol because if they're not going to commit to treatment, you're wasting your time and their money. Mm. You're not going to get treatment done. They should understand that you're only there to help them to get a favorable biological outcome. And that's the key. And talk about the MTA. If many is listening, his uncle, you know, Torbinija, was discovered with portable cement. And so, you know, middle tri oxide aggregate. Uh, was a very, very, very important discovery in dentistry. So there's so many things. I hope he's listening. I'm not sure, but I've been listening. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. I'm really grateful for your excellent lecture. Thank uh, you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. We want you back, okay? Just remember that. We want you, <laughs> we want you back in the academy. Now, <laughs> also, uh, now I'd like to introduce another second introduction to, thank you very much, to Dr. Essa Malati, who's a periodontist and implant surgeon. Uh, I love your name, Precision Periodontics. I mean, you know, that should be Precision Prosthodontics, but Periodontics is perfect, you know? It's fantastic. I, I love the name, and you are very precise. You get results. I mean, I've known uh, Essa for a long time. You're immaculate as a human being, and your work reflects the way you are. So I'm really um, honored that you are presenting our, uh, this important lecture today. I mean, the question 
that one needs to ask is to save or not to save? And that is the question. Maybe Shakespeare was a pair of donuts. What do you think? <laughs> Maybe, huh? Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> All right. Yeah, but... Thank you, George. Please proceed. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having uh, us tonight. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, uh, part of the Academy and, and uh, uh, to, to be able to share um, what we have learned uh, over the years with, uh, with uh, our great audience tonight. And, and we had a very good turnout for a, a midweek uh, Australia time. It's around close to 9 p.m. now. So it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, very, very great commitment. Uh, so appreciate everyone's uh, attending. So um, basically, um, we're going to talk about a uh, few cases and, and the rationale behind uh, the decision making in, in saving or not saving the tooth. Uh, let's say uh, more from the, the periodontal uh, perspective, I'll, I'll be sort of highlighting it. And then we, we already listened to Dr. Sharma talking about the endo, endodontic perspective, and we can uh, pick up your brain, uh, Sarkis, about the prosthodontic consideration. So um, I'll, I'll be showing these uh, three cases. Uh, the middle one is the, the joint uh, treatment that um, uh, we did with Dr. Sharma, and the other two are sort of similar situations. And, and as you notice here, uh, uh, all of them are lower in sizes, and, and uh, we were just uh, we were having this uh, chat with you, Sarkis, that uh, have this uh, sort of a, uh, a bias sort of towards uh, lower in sizes. Uh, I, I think that they really deserve um, every chance to be saved, Absolutely. and uh, and I, I sort of quickly um, go through uh, what uh, I, I think is 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 the importance of. Uh, uh, retaining lower incisors, um, you know, we, we love to retain every tooth, but when it comes to lower incisors, I think it becomes even even more important. Uh, the thing is that when we look at uh, the options for replacement uh, of a lower incisor, uh, let's say we have one lower incisor that has uh, advanced endodontic, uh, advanced periodontal problem, or or an endoperio problem, uh, and uh, and we consider an extraction. Uh, so what are the options? Uh, first of all, you know, uh, we have the, the, the two big categories of uh, removable uh, solutions and um, fixed solutions. And, and with removable, um, uh, my experience has been that the patients don't like or hate a, 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 a single tooth replacement in the lower anteriors, even even uh, um, when it comes to two or three or four lower incisors, that's just uh, uh, not a comfortable um, prosthetic options for the patient. So if you quickly go to the next slide, this is uh, generally what a, a, a lower partial denture, even a well-designed one might look like. And, and um, while, lower, well, while a partial denture can be a, a reasonable uh, solution, you know, for, uh, posterior missing teeth. When it comes to lower incisors specifically, I find that it's it's very uh, uncomfortable for patients to wear, and and uh, most of the time it just becomes uh, something that they end up not using. What are your thoughts on, on this? Uh, um... stripper, you destroy the interdental pupilla immediately uh, on both distal ends of the replaced teeth. The gum stripper, uh, and yep. uh, and uh, people do wear them unfortunately because. Uh, they have to maintain aesthetics and they won't wear posterior missing teeth mm -hmm. as molars, but they were the from premolar to premolar, premolar mm -hmm. teeth. And uh, unfortunately, it does pose a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Although they say a really well made partial digestion will work, the problem mm -hmm. is that at the end of the day, under that partial digestion, there's a lot of tissue resorption. There's no mm -hmm. question about that. At sure. the end of the day, you can get a defect. All right. So when it comes to restoring plants, if you know, the other thing is that when you've got patients with you know, with aging concerns in time and more the defect in the anterior zone, very complex to reconstruct. Okay. Yeah, so um, so removable denture is, is an option and then we can look into something that we call it a splint bridge or a, or a short form split. Uh, uh, and uh, it's basically uh, using the, the same tooth as a, as a natural pontic or sometimes even a denture tooth can be used. It's just basically a, a temporary solution. I actually tend to use this option 
uh, every now and then because I, I deal with uh, you know many mobile teeth, um, and then if, if the the tooth is uh, you know deemed for extraction, and then we decided to go down the path of extraction, sometimes we just need a, 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 a replacement option straight away until you know other things, other more long term options can be considered. But again, this is something uh, temporary. It, it although some of them. Uh, have cases that last a few years, but it never really is going to be a long-term solution for the patient. Then we get to the the option of bonded bridge. Uh, again, I, I think Sarkis, you can you can uh, comment on this. How successful are they? Or, or the way I see it is that I probably see them, and the way I, I discuss it with the patients, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they they can be considered as a, as a um, sort of um, moderate term solution, not a long term solution. So if you're looking at about maybe five years, you know, they might last okay. But uh, again, more often than not, they start, uh, you know, getting debonded uh, after that period. Okay. The, at the moment, uh, Matthias Kern conducted almost 18 year studies. Mm -hmm. and the double bonded retainers don't work as well as single bonded retainers do. So we have a lot of studies that success rate over 18 years is about 90%. So it's changed your paradigm of thinking. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, in this particular lesson you're going to show, you're not going to be able to do this because if you take the tooth out, the amount of results you'll have because it's almost a through and through defect, mm -hmm. you're not going to get that result. So it'll be a pretty ugly result because although the bridge may last, you have a huge mm -hmm. defect on the state exam that you can't, you can't restore. So the, the so, so it's basically not a not not a, not really an appropriate solution for a case that is lost due to the tooth is lost due to periodontal defect, which already had a lot of bone loss and soft tissue loss. If the patient came and the gum level is normal, there's a tooth missing. Yes, you know the first option I give them is of an implant. I say I can do this, okay, which is not no surgery, simple visits, it's enamel bone, it don't run mm. forever. That's fine. But if the patient comes with the situation that you're describing, mm -hmm. I would definitely consider what you're doing. Sure. All right, and then we have the uh, conventional breach. They might be okay when we have a, a you know a longer span situation here, where, for example, we're involving the canines. But but again, if you have if you're missing one lower incisor, and we 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 need to use utilize the the neighboring lower incisors to to give patient the option of conventional breach. Again, I think that's going to be a problem. That lower incisors are t tiny teeth, uh, prepping them uh, going to be. Uh, um, not 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 so easy. I mean, uh, it, it maybe maybe yes in in Sarkis's hands, but not in everyone's hands. So it's and because it's difficult because you're cutting teeth. You're cutting good teeth. Mm. Now every time you get the drill and you cut a tooth, remember that there's a fifty percent chance of you losing vital to that tooth mm -hmm. in the next ten to twenty five years, right? <laughs> and, and this is the issue. This is the real problem. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, every time you get cases like this for a second opinion, and now uh, after about, you know, it depends how the lubricated the hand is and how well they are high speed and water irrigate. Uh, it's it just destroying tissue. Today, today, commercial bridge, if one cuts the teeth, unless the patient's on, uh, uh, we need to, uh, we need to mute uh, Mr. Vedu, I'm afraid. Can we mute him? Can we mute him, please? All right. Now, traditionally, it was okay, but unfortunately, but unfortunately, teeth, there's other treatment options. This please. Thank you. Please proceed, Esther. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so in, in a single two missing lower incisor, I think uh, uh, what happens is that often, often we have the, uh, the, the, the neighboring teeth uh, uh, not in good shape too. So uh, when we've lost a, a lower incisor due to periodontal uh, defect, often the neighboring teeth are also involved. So they're not uh, good um, abutments for a conventional bridge, even if we can do a, a conservative uh, prep. I often, we often see that the lower incisors, we have uh, potentially have some sort of some degree of crowding, which might have been actually a contributing factor for the period disease to begin with. So again, uh, prepping crowded teeth to, to issue a, a conventional bridge. Again, that's gonna be 
potentially a problem and, and uh, potentially um, uh, predisposing the, the, the tooth to endodontic issues if, if you already have some crowding to begin with. So, um, so again, a conventional bridge gonna be uh, uh, not an ideal solution. Dental implants, yeah, well, that's, uh, if you have enough bone, yes, that's, that can be considered. But, but again, generally speaking, when we have, when we've lost a tooth due to uh, a periodontal defect, uh, then that means that we don't, we don't have uh, enough bone. Here is a case that the tooth is lost due to an endodontic problem. Yes, okay, that, that we, we have bone, although uh, very narrow, and, and this is a 2.9 millimeter implant, as you can see from the incisal view, even a 2.9 millimeter implant, um, although we didn't end up with the dehiscence, but the, the, the bone on that buckle is, is very thin, and this definitely needs to be grafted, even with grafting, you know, this uh, implant um, would be a, 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 not, a, not an ideal implant. Yep. Last question, sorry, sir. Sure. Uh, the tooth on the right side of the screen. Uh, yep. It's non there's a sort of a J curve formation. That's right. That that also needs to uh, go through the endodontic treatment, and and that's been discussed. It basically, actually, we we uh, it was found uh, during the uh, the CT scan that I took uh, and the, the PAs that I took uh, prior to uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know placing the implant. Due to the due to the timing, uh, to to be booked with the endodontist. Uh, it just happened that we did the um, implant, but as you can see, I tried to move the implant slightly away from that lesion just to make sure that that doesn't affect uh, healing. But the uh, the patient's going to see the the endodontist soon for uh, the root canal treatment of the neighboring tooth. So this is a, a case where the tooth is originally lost due to an endodontic infection, uh, so we didn't have too much bone loss, but still in lower incised area when we lose a tooth, it's gonna be a very narrow uh, space uh, or a nar narrow ridge width for, for an implant. So <clears throat> that means that we really have to seriously consider uh, saving the tooth when it comes to lowering sizes. Um, and if we end up with a situation where we, the, the tooth is lost due to periodontal defect, generally speaking, uh, we have to involve the neighboring teeth if we need to um, consider implants. So here is a case that a patient was actually going, uh, undergoing uh, orthodontic treatment, Invisalign treatment. Um, but um, one of the teeth that the tooth 4-2 actually got exfoliated during Invisalign treatment, which was very uh, uh, stressful for the, um, the clinician and also the patient because the patient started the procedure uh, hoping to, to align, uh, you know, some teeth and then ended up with a, you know, with a lost uh, tooth. And, and then when we discussed the options, the, the, the neighboring teeth were all uh, mobile, basically the, the, the rest of the lower incisors um, and also lost, uh, you know, had 50 or even 50 plus um, percent bone loss. So, uh, in order to give her a, a fixed solution uh, and a, and a long-term predictable solution, we ended up sacrificing the other three um, uh, lower incisors to be able to give her uh, implants uh, because, uh, you know, otherwise it would have been difficult to, to give her a, a long-term predictable solution. So my point here is that if, if we lose a tooth, uh, due to periodontal problems, if we want to replace with implants, we often need to involve the neighboring, neighboring lower incisors, and that becomes generally becomes a uh, a, a big uh, project, a, a very big project for the patient. Uh, here is a, another example. Again, loss of teeth due to periodontal uh, lesions, and and then uh, I think we started off with losing two teeth, and then just to, to be able to uh, accommodate implants, we had to sacrifice some of the neighboring teeth. So uh, back to the, the case that um, Garima discussed. Uh, so here we, we had all that th thought process uh, um, in place when, when we discussed about either saving or, uh, or extracting this tooth. So, so um, endoperial lesion, as you can see, there's been uh, uh, advanced bone loss, complete loss of the buccal bone. Um, and uh, what was important here to note, uh, which could possibly be, be, be sort of missed or 
uh, underlook was that if, uh, if if you only consider this as an as a as a endo problem uh, by just uh, looking at the um, let's say the preapical radiograph and and not and and um, the fact that we 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 were able to to get a good quality CBCT here uh, helped us in in proper diagnosis of the case. Uh, well, we had a, a fistula uh, and a pocket, but but um, an endodontic infection, uh, uh, you know, can have sort of um, secondary uh, periodontal manifestations. So sometimes we have an endodontic infection that is draining through uh, the, the sulcus or the pocket, and, and that can um, be treated just by doing the endo treatment. But this was, wasn't one of those cases. Here we had uh, uh, lower phrenal attachments, uh, relatively strong, that uh, basically was pulling the, the, the tissue away from the roots of the teeth. So here, uh, um, I believe that we started off with, a, even probably before the resorptive lesion, we had a, a, a very weak and, and, and possibly damaged mucogingival issue and then possibly some pockets. And, and then the endodontic infection managed to communicate with it uh, from the, uh, the apical area and then be became a, a combined endoperial lesion. So in order to successfully manage such a case, um, we need to address both issues. So uh, you know, if we do the endo treatment here, yes, the, the sinus disappeared uh, after uh, Dr. Sharma did the endo treatment, but, but the pocket was still there, so and, and that needed to be addressed. And the pocket was not going anywhere um, uh, just by the endodontic treatment because originally we, we had a, a weak um, and, and damaged periodontal apparatus there that needed to be uh, treated and strengthened as part of the uh, treatment. So <clears throat> here what we did, well, first of all, uh, we were going to do the surgery, so that was the best opportunity to address the resorptive lesion. So uh, thanks to uh, Garima, I got to use the, the TCA, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, chemical to, um, to use uh, within the uh, resorptive lesion uh, and, and then uh, seal it with uh, GIC. And then after raising a buckle flap, as you can see, we had uh, complete loss of the buckle bone. The defect was relatively... Uh, contained. So uh, from a periodontal point of view, this is a, 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 a favorable defect uh, to, to, to treat. Uh, and uh, so a combination of um, hard tissue grafting and a, a soft tissue grafting with a soft tissue substitute was used uh, together, very importantly, together with a thorough uh, debridement uh, of the root surface uh, to um, basically address the periodontal uh, defect, uh, the, the root surface, the bone loss, and also the, the soft tissue deficiency. Uh, and this is how things were looking like at, at two weeks suture removal. And then um, uh, at the review at eight, nine months, I think that was uh, how, how things were looking like. So uh, we had uh, uh, complete uh, restoration or repair of, uh, of the defect and, and uh, uh, looking uh, uh, the cross section of the tooth, we can also see uh, a, a very good sort of repair of the of the buckle bone, at least up to the uh, probably half of the root, uh, maybe forty percent of the root. That is uh, that is you know more than enough for make this tooth uh, uh, stay, amazing. Stay stay much longer. And when we have a look at, at this view, yeah, it's again it it's been it's been uh, repaired. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we we were very happy with the with the result. And this is the, the actually the twelve month clinical sort of um, view that uh, shows that we have good band of uh, uh, crotonized attached gingiva here. The pocket is completely eliminated. This is now a, a two millimeter sulcus. Obviously, the uh, the fistula is is completely healed, and and uh, uh, and it's a tooth that uh, um, should 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 last long, you know. I did some occlusal adjustment as well, just to make sure that uh, we relieve this uh, tooth from any uh, any occlusal uh, trauma that potentially 
uh, might have been one of the contributing factors. Uh, 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 but this tooth, uh, if the resorptive lesion stays silent, uh, uh, from the periodontal point of view, I'm quite confident that this tooth can uh, last, uh, last long. So um, <clears throat> then uh, I would like to share this slide, which basically going to show two sort of similar situations uh, from the bone loss point of view, and then discuss why you know I decided to to save one and and not not uh, saving the other one. Uh, so from the bone loss point of view, we can see that here the the, the teeth. Uh, uh, four one and four two had uh, advanced bone loss, you know, very close to the apex. Uh, both teeth were vital, uh, interestingly, and uh, uh, and and we had uh, some uh, diastema formation. Basically, here uh, there was some pathologic migration of the tooth. The tooth, this one specifically, was a bit over erupted. And we have a look at this premolar here. Uh, it's a very similar situation. Maybe the bone loss is even not as bad, and, but we have some gap formation uh, and also a bit of an over eruption. The gap maybe was there to begin with because this is potentially a, maybe a, a, a 4.7 that has moved mesially. Uh, so basically it's two relatively similar uh, clinical scenarios, but but in, we decided to, to retain the, the right one and, and not retain the left one. Uh, again, the same thought process of, uh, okay, if you're going to lose these two lower incisors, how on earth are we going to replace them? There's a massive bone loss. Uh, it's going to end up with uh, a, a big augmentation procedure if you want to go down the path of implants, or we're going to basically sacrifice all four, go for a conventional 3-3 to 4-3 bridge. Again, that is a lot of biological cost for the patient, uh, you know, removable Denture is not really suitable here. It's going to end up if you lose these two teeth and, and get, give the patient a removable denture. That's pretty much a recipe for losing these two teeth, the other two lower incisors, uh, not so long down the track. So uh, again, if he can retain these two teeth, it's going to be a, a massive service for the patient. Whereas on the on the on the left side, we, we've got a premolar bone loss. Um, it's the tooth is already over erupted. We have a gap that is going to act as a food trap. Even if we successfully treat the perio problem, this tooth is going to remain a, a compromised tooth and, and, and remain a nuisance for the patient. And uh, uh, considering the uh, the ease of replacement, uh, I think there is it's it's no brainer to uh, to to um, to to go for extraction in a in a left. Um, slide in the left uh, x-ray that uh, uh, basically we can uh, very predictably take the tooth out, do some grafting here, repair the damage to a great extent and, and then place an implant. Uh, the the uh, nerve is somewhere here so we have uh, a proper distance and, and we can place an implant and then a, a, an implant crown can actually solve the issue of the gap as well which then you know solves the issue of the food trap for the patient. So um, with that thought process, we decided to retain the right one and, and then not retain the, the left one. <clears throat> um, so here is, uh, the, the teeth were vital. Basically, this was uh, just a perio, um, advanced perio lesion. Uh, teeth were uh, splinted together, very important in, in these situations. Uh, we need to have stable uh, teeth to, to be able to, uh, uh, to do periodontal treatment. I was give the example of, to the patient that if you have a fractured arm, you need to have it casted so that um, things can heal well. So splint plays a big role. If the teeth are uh, moving, we can't do proper debridement, we can't do surgery, and we can't uh, treat them well. Uh, you can see here, it's uh, uh, this is a 12 millimeter probe uh, with three millimeter markings. So it's a six millimeter um, uh, Sub uh, infrabony defect basically, and this uh, treated with uh, guided tissue regeneration, and uh, and then um, an 11 millimeter pocket uh, down the track. Uh, we have a 24 month review. I, I think I now I should have even more than that. Um, uh, got down to four millimeter. Uh, good uh, repair of the bone. 
and then the teeth are still stable and and the the the, um, the splint is also still there this is this is how things are looking like uh, at, at this stage um, very uh, healthy looking tissues uh, uh, minimal pockets basically patients keeping the area clean given the uh, dif the difficulty in, in, in keeping this area clean, the patient, uh, she's doing really well. Uh, obviously, we can tell uh, that the patient is not cosmetically concerned, really doesn't really show in, in her smile that area. So she just basically wanted to, to, to save her teeth. Um, yeah, so this one was uh, a, a case of an advanced perilesion. Um, this is another endoperio case, which I... I um, had the pleasure of treating with Dr. Uh, Rahimi. Um, here we have a patient presented firstly to me with a, uh, with a fistula um, and uh, the referring dentist uh, originally thought that it's a, it's a, it's a perio problem given the fact that the, uh, the radiolucency on the x-ray is, is more on the side of the tooth rather than uh, apically uh, positioned. So um, um, when I checked the tooth, tooth was uh, uh, almost non-vital or very vaguely responding or very it's a delayed response. So, um, and uh, I knew that if, if you're gonna treat this, uh, uh, I need uh, endodontically uh, to, be, um, to be firm uh, to, or to know exactly what we, we, we're dealing with. So I asked uh, Dr. Rahimi to get involved and, and he uh, advised that uh, we uh, proceed with uh, endodontic treatment uh, together with periodontal treatment. Um, and, and he was suggesting that uh, uh, we possibly have a, a lateral canal here. Then that's why we have the, that, that type of uh, lesion there. And then which then that is basically managed to communicate with the uh, uh, the periodontal defect. So here the decision to, to, to save the tooth was uh, again, um, you know, real, for us, it was uh, again, a no brainer. We, if, if you have a chance to save an upper incisor, the biological cost of losing a bio, uh, an upper incisor is gonna be huge. This patient had uh, a relatively high smile line, um, or maybe not so much high smile and it's, ba it's basically short clinical crown. So it's sort of a bit of a delayed type passive eruption. Uh, and um, so uh, if you're gonna lose that tooth, it's gonna be uh, not, not so easy to replace it, giving the patient the aesthetics uh, that they deserve. So <clears throat> uh, after some root debridement, the, the, uh, the, the fistula, uh, disappeared, then uh, pulp extirpation done by Dr. Rahimi. He confirmed that uh, uh, the, the, the pulp was necrotic when he uh, opened up. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, six months after root debridement and uh, completion of RCT. Even without any surgical approach, we can see that uh, the, the bone started to, to come back. So I, I did mention to patient initially that um, most likely we will need to uh, do um, a periodontal surgery, uh, but uh, fortunately uh, we didn't have to and, uh, and things started to heal uh, in, you know, much better than we were expecting. Um, we even got this patient to get some orthodontic treatment because um, she, he had some other orthodontic issues as well. If you have a look at this, uh, initial uh, x-ray, we can see that there was some gap formation. And um, so basically he got some orthodontic treatment together with uh, <clears throat> full mouth perio treatment because he had some uh, other perio issues. Uh, so a, a tooth that we started off with such a massive lesion, endoperio combined, and, you know, uh, treated, and then we even managed to, to move this, auto, uh, this tooth orthodontically in a better position. And a 12 millimeter pocket uh, with this combined management uh, down to four millimeter. <clears throat> and uh, here's another case, uh, uh, probably a, a final case, I think from memory in my slide. So uh, again, another case that I treated with, uh, uh, with Dr. Rahimi, uh, advanced endoperio lesion. I wish that I had uh, 
uh, the good CT scan that we have at, at our practice uh, um, at the moment. I wish that I had it back then because this is, um, I think I, I saw this patient in, initially about four or five years ago. Um, and um, so um, the, again, a similar situation with the same thought process. We thought if you're gonna lose this, if you lose this tooth, it's gonna be a, a, a big challenge to replace it. Um, uh, radiographically, I could see um, some bony walls. So I was hoping that, uh, that uh, we have uh, a sort of at least a two wall defect that we can uh, consider uh, doing uh, gutta tissue regeneration for. Uh, so, uh, and as you can see, uh, we had some lingual um, bony wall there present, uh, although partially missing. The buccal was, wall was almost completely missing. But we sort of um, embarked on the sort of a heroic journey of trying to save this, this tooth. And of course, patient was um, uh, quite willing to, to do that. And the alternatives were not that, um, that easy and, 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 and much more costly and much more complex for the patient. So the decision for the patient was, was easy, sort of easy to make. Uh, that, okay, if, if, if there is a chance to save this tooth, I would definitely want to give it a go. Um, so baseline, and uh, here at this point, uh, pulp extirpation done by Dr. Rahimi, uh, got a tissue regeneration surgery. Uh, we can see that the, 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 the process of healing uh, at about one month, uh, and then at about three months, we can see signs of good healing happening. And uh, at some time around about four or five months, I, I was feeling that clinically and radiographically, we have enough um, improvement that, uh, you know, can justify completion of the root canal treatment. We didn't want to, initially, we didn't want to uh, uh, commit the patient to the cost of completion of root canal treatment if the tooth is not going to be saved. Uh, and honestly, not myself and not many, none of us were confident enough that we can, we can uh, pull this off. So, um, and once we felt that um, the tooth is going or the healing is going the, in the right direction, uh, then root canal treatment uh, beautifully uh, completed by Dr. Rahimi. And, and this is how things are looking like after 18 months, uh, massive difference and, and, and uh, a big change in, in what we started off with and uh, the, the current situation. Situation. And again, teeth were splinted, occlusal adjustment. These are all important uh, factors or important considerations in, in treatment of such teeth uh, where we have mobility, where uh, potentially some occlusal interferences or premature contacts, uh, which can be secondary to perio problems, uh, were actually part of the problem. So we potentially had a perio problem, tooth started to, to move a little bit and then um, uh, uh, got into a, a premature contact and, and that uh, uh, the accelerated the, the process of the bone loss and, and, and deterioration of the periodontal tissues. So, um, and this is uh, 15 millimeter pocket to begin with down to four millimeter. And that's a, a two year follow-up. Um, uh, that's a patient that I was seeing at a different clinic, which I'm now no longer working at. Unfortunately, uh, lost track of the patient. So I wish that I could see how things are looking like at currently, which is about five years uh, post-treatment of, of this case. Uh, just, uh, you know, just a wrap up. Uh, basically, uh, several patient-related and tooth-related factors need to be considered to reach decision as to save or extract in, in each case. And uh, uh, what I'll do, I'll give my patients uh, the options. I inform them of what is possible and, and involve them in decision-making. So I, 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 don't, uh, I don't promise, I just tell them that, okay, I, I feel with, with, with my experience or in, in my hands, I think this is, this is possible. So, um, and, and then I involve them in that decision-making. Uh, and, and I firmly believe that a tooth with a strategic value, like a lower incisor, like an upper incisor, uh, where a replacement is 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 not not easy, uh, and and has uh, biological cost or even you know much more financial cost, um, in a motivated patient such a tooth deserves uh, a chance even if uh, that uh, you know uh, 
initially seemed seemed like a, a, a heroic attempt. I think uh, uh, I've personally been proved uh, wrong over and over that uh, uh, a tooth that I was originally thinking that is not salvageable uh, with, uh, you know, addressing the etiological factors, uh, first of all, diagnosing and, you know, um, the etiological factors and, and then addressing them one by one. Um, I've been proved wrong that, you know, such teeth can, can, can be uh, saved. Um, and that's it for me. Fantastic. Esam, I congratulate you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Uh, it was amazing the results you have. And uh, it's against all odds you maintain the biology, you rebuild biology, you give the biology a chance to be able to repair itself. I think that's the key, isn't it, to the treatment. You're thinking, you're diagnosing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, can you go back to the slide uh, where the orthodontic treatment caused the loss of some of those teeth? Just interesting, I want, I want to ask you a couple of questions in terms of going back, back. The, there's a lower case, but it lower between plants. Going back. Oh yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Good one, right? Go back next one. I mean, you think, uh, and again, I don't respect everyone, you think that, uh, go to the original slide with the CT scan we just had just now, please. Mm -hmm. That's it. You think that before you start any orthodontic treatment, you'll check the periodontal status of the patient, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a classical case where there's been zero diagnosis. I mean, basically, with all due respect, the aim was to put the teeth in the right position, no respect to biology, the periodontal support. I'm looking at the rest of the teeth, there's a, a lot of margin inflammation, and there's yep. a loss. Is there <coughs> On, yeah, yeah, this yeah this patient basically had uh, generalized perio, uh, right. sort of generalized generalized moderate perio as you can see here. You rightly pointed out, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of subgingival calculus, a lot of inflammation. So, I mean, how uh, did anyone start this sort of case without first fixing the perio? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a common, you know, they say the common sense is no longer common. Mm -hmm. This is exactly its plus here. Would you agree on that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, you know, a patient lost those teeth, had a patient consulted you, for instance, mm -hmm. and you would have maintained those teeth mm -hmm. and given a chance mm -hmm. with a very light forces like, you know, by yeah. by. I think that those teeth, uh, in, you know, I've, I've saved and maintained teeth, you know, much worse than what we can see in, in these images. So for me, these were very uh, maintainable, uh, very much maintainable. Uh, but once you lose one of them, then it becomes a, a big problem. Then, okay, so uh, so now I've got another three there. I'll have to replace the missing one. So how do I replace that missing one uh, when I have the other three that they have sort of 50% bone loss? When they, all four are there, we can splint them. We can do all those sort of, sort of things. You know, we, we can do a lot with them, but and we can make them stable and we can retain them for long. But once you lose one of them, it's just going to be a disaster and in some cases you know after discussing with you know options with patient in this particular case we ended up deciding that it's actually best um that we we you know sacrifice the other three so uh it's just an example that uh, uh not not noticing the period or not addressing the period at the right time for a patient that was going through orthodontic treatment mostly for cosmetic reasons actually ended up being four missing teeth two implants, a four unit bridge. So uh, when I saw the patient uh, for consult, uh, you know, she was crying basically because that was just not what um, uh, she was expecting. And obviously the, the clinician unfortunately was quite distressed as well. So we had a long chat over the phone. Fortunately, we, the patient is now happy and, and she's okay. And then, and, uh, you know, um, she's sort of got used to the whole situation, but, but it's, it's something that, you know, no one wants to go through, you know, either as, as the patient or the clinician. I think you deserve an accolade because you've managed to look after a patient, reduce any, any litigation issues mm. and re reduce any, you know, anger. So I mean, basically, I think your skills in patient management in this case needs to be congratulated how you approach all case and measures. I mean, sometimes, how do you sometimes explain to a patient and he comes in, are they are rate and 
you know, you tell them, look, unfortunately, these things can happen. We know that when you have a plaque and any occlusional trauma, and also when trauma is an occlusional trauma, I mean, the old, uh, I mean, it comes back to Linus time, doesn't it? Where a plaque and occlusional trauma, you're going to get bone loss. You're going to get angle of bone loss, which is very common. Yeah. I mean, that was all missed. And the, that's what I'm saying, you know, the, we teach at the college diagnosis and treatment planning. And I keep saying this all the time. And, and uh, you know, the empirical thinking, the, the uh, you know, recipe-based thinking, it just has to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I keep saying that recipe belongs in the kitchen, not in the dental surgery. Mm -hmm. Keep, you know, when I have colleagues ask me, what do you do here? Are oh, you do this one? What do you do this one? But you can't think that way. Every case is a prototype. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to look at a patient level, you know, tooth level, gum level, and bone level. And all this you put together as one package. I think uh, Garima talked about you got to get the whole package when you're treating patients. And this is a classical case, how you approach and, and uh, you solve the problem for the patient. I guess patients end up having an instant orthodontics, <laughs> you know, which they didn't probably initially desire. <laughs> That's true. So, there's a classic case of a, we yeah, we, 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 we have we have uh, four very aligned lower incisors here. <laughs> As I said, the less it's a lot we have, which means the thing speaks for itself. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Uh, any questions? I'm just having a look. Uh, I think... Dr. Sarkis, I just wanted to make an announcement. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of inquiries from... Um, a lot of general dentists on, they want to discuss specific cases um, with that in their opinion uh, could have been done in a different way. And they wanted opinions from uh, specialists. So I just wanted to make an announcement that if anyone has such cases, uh, please feel free to send an email to education at icodp.com. And one of our staff members will uh, organize a session and we, uh, we can go through such cases. And, and you know, Dr. Sarkis and other specialists would be more than happy to educate and help on specific cases. If there is anything like that, please feel free to send it to um, education at icodp.com. Most welcome. Most welcome. We're happy to share our knowledge and information. May I uh, conclude today's meeting by thanking our speakers? Uh, Specialist and Adonis Garima Sharma, Garima Sharma and uh, Specialist Periodontist and Implant Surgeon Esa Melati. I thank you for your generosity. I thank you for your honesty in, and your knowledge for sharing it with us and saying the truth. And, uh, and it's been a pleasure having you today and also thank being you. at college. I'd like to thank all the participants who have, uh, who have joined us in this group discussion with the experts. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.